Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to this uh, meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Management Board meeting. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the meeting. Um, just to make sure you're aware, we, this meeting is being recorded. Um, so when you do speak, please remember to turn on your microphones, otherwise we may not pick up what, what it is you're saying. Um, do very brief introductions. Um, my, I'm Councillor Tony Dyer. I'm the Chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Management Board. Councillor Mark Bradsaw is the Vice Chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Management Board. And I'm flanked on my left by Stephen Peacock, who is the Chief Executive of Bristol City Council. And on my right by Lucy, who will be monitoring everything we do very carefully <laughs> and make sure I keep to the agenda as well. Um, I'll allow councillors to introduce themselves as and when um, they make comments, and the same for uh, invited guests and officers. Um, safety information, we are not expecting a fire alarm, but if the, so if the fire alarm does go, then it means that it's not a test and we do need to leave calmly through the, the main doors um, of City Hall down the ramp to the right hand side and then please congregate outside the west end of uh, Worcester Cathedral where you would be then uh, noted and marked off by a fire officer. Agenda item number two is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence? Just to note that Councillor Massey uh, is likely to be late. Thanks Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, agenda item number three is declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest? No, thank you very much. Minutes of previous meeting, agenda item number four, I believe those meetings are still in preparation. The notes are ready to be approved. Oh, I stand corrected. The notes are ready to be approved. So do any members have any uh, comments regarding the minutes or are you happy for them to be approved? Okay, I take that as happy to be approved. Item number five is chair's business. Um, I don't have any chair's business apart from pointing out that at this meeting we'll only be looking at the business plans for Gorham Homes and Worcester Holding. There will be a later Ozen meeting scheduled for the 27th at which we will look at the Worcester Waste business plans. So that moves us on to item number six, which is public forum. Uh, we did have questions from two members of the public. Unfortunately, they've had to send their apologies and the responses to the questions will be made available to them. We then have three statements. Um, statement number one, uh, the individual concerned has, has not been able to attend. So we'll move on to statement number two, which is by our old friend, David Wedgelow. I will be keeping you to one minute, David, as Thank best you. as can. Well, I just want to basically pick up on the, the crisis on the buses, really, in Bristol, and it is a crisis in Greater Bristol. And I want to clarify two or three points that were made at the previous Oslo meeting, and that's just to really explain that most of the bus contracts um, that are out in Bristol at the moment are not run by FIRST for the West Wing and Mirror Combined Authority. They're actually run by Big Lemon, A-Bus, um, Eurotaxis, very small, small businesses, very small operators. Uh, Big Lemon was a social enterprise that Bristol City Council encouraged to come into the city by going to Brighton, encouraging the cooperative companies to come here. Those companies are all losing their contracts, apart from one service in uh, South Bristol, the 515, which is uh, Stockwood across the city. Um, it's going to be, I, I didn't mince my words when I said it, it's going to be a desert of bus services in South Bristol. Um, there will be no way of crossing South Bristol by bus apart from on the airport flyer. That is it. You have to go into the city centre. School journeys will stop. College journeys will stop. There will be outcry. And I was on a call yesterday with First Great Western Railway, First Group PLC. They run the trains and the buses in the city on a regulated profit. Um, and they made it clear just that in North Bristol, you will not be able to travel from Westbury on Trim or Southmead Hospital to UW or simply to Bristol Parkway. So, you know, got, Southmead Hospital has just basically got half its bus network removed. This is a serious situation. needs some real serious discussion with Wecker and whether we can use any bus service improvement money. But I can tell you this now. 
Mark Harper's looking at this with horror, and I don't think it's a good idea to have a Secretary of State looking at Bristol and the West of England in this way. It's not good for reputation. I just okay, David, can you wrap up? My with... final point is, I really asked uh, Stephen Peacock to start looking at this with the, directors, with the Chief Executive of Weka, because it's quite serious, and we know the problems at Weka. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. The third uh, public statement is from Councillor Jeff Gollop. Jeff. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, I wish to raise concerns about the Bristol Waste and its business plan. Last month, all the members were told the business plan had been delayed. This seemed unusual given the timetable for business plans had been clearly established and agreed. We're told the plan would now be brought to an additional Ozum meeting on the 27th of January. Now, I was surprised on Friday of last week to receive notification from Companies House that the interim managing director had ceased to be a director of Bristol Waste, having left on the 12th of January, which I believe was before we were notified of the change regarding the business plan. I cannot understand for one moment why it occurred to anyone that not sharing that information with members was a good idea. It seems quite remarkable and extraordinary that it's concealed from us in the hope that we wouldn't find out and notice. Had we been briefed in confidence, it would have remained in confidence even when it was on the public registry. But when we find out from the public registry, and we have no explanation and no background given. I can only be suspicious of what has gone on and what the problems are and how big they are. Now, let's be clear, this is the third managing director de to depart. If the departure is the reason for the delay, we could have been told. In previous years, we have at least known that the managing director of each company was actually instrumental in leading the business plan. Is there a managing director? Is anybody leading the business plan? What is happening in a company that provides a major service to every resident in Bristol? Uh, it would be helpful, first of all, for us to be reassured that the plan will be available by the 20th of February. Um, and it would also be nice if we could be told who is acting is managing director. Uh, and just to be clear, Tony, I realise that you may well be aware of more than the rest of us, and if he was here, Councillor Pearce would be in that situation as well. I am not looking to be difficult as far as either of you are concerned, but I do make the point that we, de we require a degree of transparency and openness that has clearly failed us at the moment. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Councillor Gallup. And that leads us neatly, neatly into the next agenda item, which is the company's business plans. Um, I would say in advance that we are going to be looking at an exempt section. Um, so the first part of this will be focusing on what is in the public domain and has, has been published. Please avoid asking any questions about the information that's in the assent session until we move into the assent session um, a bit later on. So I believe that Helen, you're going to do a quick introduction. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, to introduce myself, I'm Helen Davis, Shareholder Liaison Manager. I'm responsible for supporting the liaison uh, between BCC and the council companies from a governance perspective. This meeting is part of the annual process where OSM have an opportunity to review the business plans on their journey to approval at Cabinet. The approval of business plans is a reserve matter to BCC as shareholder, um, and as it meets the threshold of key decision, it's a decision which is made at Cabinet by Councillor Cheney, Deputy Mayor, who is also the delegated shareholder representative. Paper going to Cabinet will contain business plans for Gorham Homes, Bristol Waste and Bristol Holding. The Bristol Waste business plan, as mentioned, will be considered at a separate meeting of OSM on the 27th of February. In terms of the structure for the meeting, we'll consider Gorham Homes business plan first, followed by Bristol Holding, and then opportunity to go into the exempt session for questions on the exempt part of the Gorham business plan. Joining the meeting, we've got Jessie Wild, the Gorham Homes operational sponsor from the housing delivery team. She's also uh, able to answer any questions about housing 
housing strategy, which are more appropriately addressed to the council, and Chris Smith, FD of Bristol Holding, who's provided a commentary based on Bristol Holdings' role in carrying out assurance on the company business plans for, on behalf of the shareholder. This commentary was published separately um, and is part of the supplementary pa papers for this meeting. So I'll no, now hand over to um, Aman, Stephen and Chris from Gorman Homes to introduce the business plan. Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the members of uh, the panel in inviting me today. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Aman Dalvi. I'm the Chair of Gorham Homes. Just a quick one-minute uh, uh, tour of my experience. I have worked as a Chief Executive of a local authority. Uh, I have been in regeneration for almost 40 years. Uh, I was a Chief Executive of a Housing Association and Economic Development Agency, uh, and also was on the Board of English Partnerships, the National Regeneration Agency, uh, and on the Board of the Olympic Park Legacy Company. So that's a quick whistle-stop tour of my, my background. If I could ask the slides to be moved to our objectives, which is, I believe, is the next one. After, next one. Thank you. So we've got four objectives. The first one, as you, you will know, uh, is to move at a pace uh, to increase the supply of new homes in, 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 in Bristol uh, and to assure that we, that we uh, provide uh, good, affordable housing as well. But of course, in building these homes, we want to make sure that they're sustainable homes uh, which minimize the impact on the environment. What we also want to do is to build homes where people want to live. And I said earlier on that I've been in regeneration all my life. And one of the things I have discovered is that the residents will tell you whether they like to live in their homes two years after the developers have left, uh, not when the developers are on site. So I have had almost 30 years of experience uh, behind me, which indicates where people want to live and how they want to live, and that's important. And finally, we are here also to provide a, a commercial return to our shareholder, uh, which is the council, uh, and to ensure that we meet uh, the highest of standards of social and environmental accountability as well. So if I ask for the next slide, please. I think underpinning the work that any organization does uh, is good governance. Uh, and uh, we have a strong uh, board in place. It's a small board, uh, but it has all the relative skills on it. Uh, and many of us have either uh, commercial development, financial auditing, or housing experience. This year, we created an audit and risk assurance committee. Uh, this was in order to address uh, 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 the restructuring of Western Holding. Uh, so we've appointed in recent weeks uh, a person called Andrew Martin Jones, who was a partner at Deloitte, a senior partner, who actually lives uh, uh, in, in Bristol, uh, and we're really pleased to have him uh, on the board. The majority of our projects are delivered uh, via joint venture partnership or an LLP, as is shown on the screen, uh, with a 50% share for Gorham Homes. So the board of the LLP oversees the performance of the development. So I'm a member of the board, uh, and in the two boards that have been created, I, I actually chair the board. Uh, and it's the case that at least in the first year, I will be chairing the board, and then it rotates uh, to, to, to others as well. Uh, and finally, uh, our certification, B Corp certification, is progressing well. I'm not going to read it out for you. It's out on the screen for you to, to have a look at. Ask for the next slide, please. So the highlights are, you will have seen that we are now building one lock lease, uh, which has got 268 homes on it, and 55% of that will be council housing for social rent and shared ownership. So this was really important for us to ensure that our first site, a flagship site, uh, did what was necessary in the sense that we wanted to make a return for the council, but at the same time we wanted to have uh, 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 at least 50% affordable housing on site, and we've been able to do that and make the scheme stack up as well. Uh, on Hengrove, we have broken ground on the first phase of 53 homes, again for council housing. 
uh, it is our desire and our intention to build 1,435 homes. Again, 50% of that will be affordable for social rent and shared ownership. Now, this is a large site, uh, and we have to ensure that in our delivery of this site, we're able to mitigate the risk that comes with developing sites of this nature. And a bit later on in my presentation, I'll talk a bit about risk. Uh, both Dovercourt Road and Fosway Road are now in outline uh, planning. As I said earlier, that we like to work with local communities to ensure that we're building properly and in, in a way that suits the community. So we've had community-led design on Radcliffe Way, uh, and we've also got a skills academy, as you will see the picture at one lock lease. If I could ask for the next slide, please. I think you will all know that the housing market uh, has grown uh, through 2022, but there has been in the last few months or so uh, enormous turmoil in the market. Uh, inflation has been running at 10.5%. Uh, but I think what I would say is that although inflation is running at 10.5%, the underlying inflation for building cost materials is much higher because there's a building cost uh, escalator uh, that uh, applies to, to building supplies. And not only that, but also to labor because you're unable to recru recruit labor as well. Now, the government's uh, uh, in, uh, uh, statistics show that uh, inflation is going to fall off a cliff edge uh, and go right down to 2.5% in a matter of 18 months. I mean, as an organization, we can't uh, work on that principle. We have to assume that we're going to have a gradual uh, decline in the rate of inflation. I think any prudent uh, uh, board would want to do it that way. I think we all realize that there's a huge uh, impact of cost of living. Uh, it puts pressure on people who are borrowing. Uh, people cannot borrow at the rates that they were originally able to borrow, and they've got other concerns like utilities and what have you. So we need to, to, be, to, be, to make sure that the product that we're putting on our sites is affordable and accessible to, to our residents. Having said all of that, I think that it's, uh, it would be good to say that housing supply in Bristol has bounced back since the pandemic, uh, and around 2,500 new homes have been built, not by, by Gorham Homes, but by everyone. So that's, that's, uh, that's good. I could ask for the next slide, please. So in summary, you know, I've alluded to the fact that we've got uh, market challenges. Uh, and we have to ensure that our board and our audit committee rises to those challenges. But our mission remains, which is to work uh, in partnership to build sustainable homes, uh, to create communities, respect the environment, and of course to uh, uh, contribute to the economy as well. And what we want to do is to transform council-owned land. So I'll pass on to Steve. Thank you, Aman. Do you want to turn your mic off? Great. So delving more into the business plan as a document itself, we, um, the slide you'll see is on performance. Um, and we've looked at five themes in these cover delivery. So what it is that we're actually doing, our financial performance, which Chris, uh, after I've spoken, will cover environmental, um, how we're doing regarding biodiversity as an example and net zero carbon. Uh, places, Amans touched a little bit about placemaking and procurement. These are the five indicators that we work with the council on how we're doing. So they are themes that run through our business plan. Next slide, please. So our, our pipeline in 2023, um, we continue to see growth in the number of projects that Gorham will be looking at in the coming year. Um, we're delighted that to be able to make such a positive contribution in the city. Um, our business plan shows 3,112 homes projected across 15 sites. We expect 
that those numbers will change in future years, um, as they have done in previous programmes and plans. So if you remember, previous programmes did actually show a number of sites that are no longer on that list. So sites will come and go from the Gorham Homes list as we move forward. Um, of the 3,112, we are forecasting that 1,556 of those will be affordable homes. Um, we have a target within our business plan to hit 50% affordable housing. We're currently at 47%. We'll delve into that a little bit deeper as we, as we go forward. But our target is still to uplift that to 50%. Low and zero carbon homes, uh, we have stretching targets to get to 2030 in line with the council's targets to do that. Um, we are moving well towards that um, and we continue to do that in this business plan aiming for EPC rating A and to hit the REBA 2030 challenge which it gives you a staged incremental approach to move to net zero by 2030. Sustainable communities, we uh, score all our projects against what's called Building for Life and we're continuing to do that and we have a target to hit high standards of um, community facilities which are picked up in those scoring so that's the information that we provide to the council. Biodiversity net gain, we're working very hard on all of our projects to um, increase biodiversity on site so not looking to make off-site provision for biodiversity and Baltic Wharf as an example achieves 33% increase in biodiversity habits in comparison to what's there currently. Next slide please. So a high standard of sustainability I've touched on already um, but wanted to really flag that as something that we take very seriously in, in Gorham Homes. We, we are in a um, number of crises as a as a society, a climate and emergency and a habitats and um, biodiversity crisis. So we are looking to try and move what our brownfield sites in entirety in our programme into spaces that encourage wildlife. And we do that by working with, building with nature for accreditation and also using biodiversity net gain as a, as a measurement. So we're pleased and proud of the work that we're doing. There is always more to do. Um, and this business plan continues on that trajectory as we move forward. Next slide, please. Um, affordable homes. Uh, Aman has mentioned that homes are very, very expensive in Bristol. Uh, affordable house, homes production for us is something that we all care deeply about as an organisation. We are really aligned with our values and really are delighted when we're able to bring projects forward with very high levels of affordable housing. As I say, our target is 50%. Um, we're currently at 40%. We will continue to bring that up. Um, as we go through the planning process, we move through a business plan stage where we use the planning um, assumptions and then we move forward when we get to planning and then when we're absolutely sure of the mix and then try and move into contract at our target of 50% which we have done in the projects that are now in contract and moving forward forward for example um, we're looking at Hengrove Park at bookends uh, that's shown in the image on the screen so that will be 100% council housing that has broken ground in Hengrove and is underway um, one lock lease in, um, in lock lease I'm so used to saying Romney House, I must remind myself that One Lockley's introduces where it is. It is 55% affordable housing, that's underway, um, some really good progress and we're really pleased with the um, production that's happening with Vistry Partnerships, now Countryside Partnerships and we're prioritising the affordable housing to come out in the early phase of that development. Uh, so that project's moving very nicely forward after a very slow and protracted pro track through planning. Uh, New Fosway Road, more than 100 affordable homes, including an extra care housing scheme. That is a, um, a scheme for people who are older, um, who need to live in a community that has a degree of support in it. So we're excited to be able to do that uh, alongside the other affordable housing that we deliver. Next slide, please. Uh, supporting communities. So the, the three pictures at the top are um, actually a group called the Conservative Volunteers. Conservation, not the Conservative. I do apologise. <laughs> oh dear, terribly sorry. Um, sorry, Councillor Gollop. Um, the, so th these volunteers have come to um, Lockleys and have done a huge amount of work in the community, but this is really only the beginning of the work that will be happening in Lockleys. Um, our Skills Academy will be... Um, Fantastic, and really we are very proud to be able to leave a proper legacy in Lockleys. There'll be 277 weeks of training, 27 weeks of work placement, and there will be um, houses for people to come on, 
uh, increase their skills, learn the trades, and actually be able to get meaningful jobs in the construction industry um, when that development is finished. So we're really pleased with the way that's going to go um, at Lockleys. And it will be a hub for uh, a lot of Bristol, so it won't only be just Lockleys, but Lockleys will be the anchor area for the Skills Academy. So we're expecting that to start um, on site in March and will be open very, very soon with the first people being able to take advantage of that. Uh, next slide, please. So supporting our city, uh, while well, Pipeline has, as I've said, 3,112 homes and also generate millions of pounds of new homes bonus for the council, 55% affordable homes will mean that 1,556 households out of temporary housing and into a stable home. And we all know the importance of a stable community and home for everybody. Um, that's a gallop through the main headlines of the business plan, ignoring the finance section. I'll hand over to Chris, our finance director, who will run you through um, from the next slide onwards, please. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon. So, Aman has already introduced the very dynamic external environment we're facing at the moment. So, what we did in our business plan is adopt a very prudent and cautious approach in its construction. So to expand on that, what we've done is include the results in terms of profit from only four of our developments, the four that have been mentioned earlier, from our extensive pipeline. And in addition to that, we have included all the costs necessary to deliver the planning and deal arrangements for the entire pipeline. So we've built a lot in there. And that plan is completed and will work within the existing approved ceiling for our pipeline from cabinet. So, sorry, that was the next slide. <laughs> Just wander that one through. In terms of the outturn results, the cumulative profit for Gorham turns positive in 25-26, and that is consistent with our business plan presented last year as well. As we increase the number of deals and structures we construct, and those then turn into operational home delivery on site, and those in turn will be running for several years, so a lot of these will be running concurrently, we recognise that we need to also move our focus into managing our risk comprehensively. So ahead of that rollout on site, we've already put together an audit committee that Aman has alluded to, and the chair of that audit committee is also a board member, so there is review right through to Gorham Board of our activities and assessment of risks and decisions that we take. Uh, and I think that's that's it. From that was the risk one, wasn't it? So. Well, I covered both. We didn't move on. So that was the risk. Okay, so that brings uh, uh, it to an end. I just want to finish off. I think what I'd like to stress, and this is something I often stress to my own board as well, which is that I understand, we understand, that the principal shareholder of Gorham Homes is Bristol City Council and we are owned by Bristol City Council, and the funding that we get is from Bristol City Council, and, if, and, and also the fact that because it's public sector money, our board are the guardians of public sector money, so we have to make sure that that money is spent properly and is spent in doing what we need to do, which is to produce housing and within that to provide affordable housing. We want to ensure that our risk is mitigated, that we don't create a problem for the council in the future, and that we produce the housing that we said we would and to provide a commercial return. And our board is always mindful uh, of those values in the way that it makes its decisions. I think we have a very good relationship with the local authority, uh, and we wish to continue to do that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Amal. Okay, I'm going to open it up to, for questions now. Uh, just to remind members that, as well as Chris, uh, Stephen, and Aman, we also have uh, Jesse from the BCC Delivery Board Strategic Client. I'm sure Helen will jump in if there's questions he thinks he's going to add further information to. And Chris Smith, who's the FD of Bristol Holdings, may also want to respond as well. And of course, other uh, members, we have Denise, who's always a very welcome member of uh, OSM, but may want to have a bit of a break this time, I imagine. <laughs> so, who would like to go first with questions? Councillor Kent. 
Thanks, Jake. Can I just check? I actually have a question for Bristol Holdings rather than Gorham Homes, but is that appropriate? Because we have their business plan, um, but I just wanted to check that at this point we could ask Bristol Holdings questions, or is it more for Gorham Homes? It, at this stage, it's more for Gorham Homes. We will be looking at Bristol Holdings af afterwards, so they'll be able to respond, okay. unless it's a question for Bristol Holdings that's specifically about the Gorham Homes business plan. No, it's not. Uh, for now, I'll hold my question for Gorham Homes. That's what else coming first. Okay, Councillor Wilcox. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in um, the sites that have dropped off your pipeline, uh, particularly uh, the Blake House site and the Cameron House, uh, Cameron Centre sites in Lockleys. I just wondered why they might um, have disappeared and what the rationale for removing them was, please. I'll answer first, and then Jesse may want to add further. Um, the position regarding the delivery of Blake and Cameron um, is that we've had a conversation with the council and the council have said that they feel that they would be best placed to take that forward. So we then, um, in consultation with the council, remove them from our pipeline and certainly from the Blake Centre perspective, uh, the housing delivery team will look to take that forward to the market. So we want to keep an agile list in Gorham Homes and when we collectively come to the decision uh, that other people may be better placed to deliver it, we'll gladly step aside and let them take that forward. Uh, Jesse, do you have anything to add? I can't see you behind me, but I'm assuming that you're saying yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I think just to kind of reiterate what Stephen said, that we have a really good relationship with the RPs, the housing associations in the city, and um, as part of the conversations that we have ongoing with Gorham Homes as the housing delivery team, we, we discussed it and thought actually it's going to be better to be delivered by some of our partners there. So it came off Gorham Homes pipeline list and has been is going to be taken forward through the Homes West um, network and partnership through the strategy and enabling team. Thank you. So it was a case of more of more spreading the risk around as opposed to uh, uh, Gorham delivering it all by itself. Yeah, and I also think it's it, it, because it's specifically an extra care home, um, we, we have partners in the city that are set up perfectly to do that much more so. And so it actually, it's in some ways much more appropriate. Thank you. I've got another question, unless anybody wants to jump in. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you talked on one of your slides about your sustainable building techniques. Since, uh, on average, 50 tonnes of carbon is embedded in the actual construction of the house. Can you detail the steps that you're taking to reduce the embedded carbon in homes that are built by Gorham, please? Yes, I can. Um, so I think along with the rest of the industry, um, embedded carbon is the next big challenge. I, I don't think that Gorham Homes or anybody has really dealt with that entirely. Uh, it will be significant as we move forward. We are doing a number of different things regarding embedded carbon. We're looking at how we can use timber more widely in our construction approach. We're also looking at other materials we can use, such as uh, stone, and we've looked at how we could utilise stone at our Castle Park development. That's a very interesting material to be using from an embodied carbon perspective because the carbon that's required to build stone has already happened. So um, really sort of going back to first principles um, and you looking at materials in a way that we hadn't previously thinking about when we use steel what that steel is and how it's manufactured and how it could be used in the future so um, we are thinking about materials at the moment we're building our plan for how we will monitor those materials how we'll deal with them as potential credits in the future but as I said before the the Reba 2030 guidelines move in a, in a staged approach uh, and while we're trying to balance a range of different priorities across our program for high levels of affordable housing, placemaking, and um, all the environmental benefit we talked about, uh, embodied carbon is still moving its way up the priority list for us, Councillor Wilcox. But I, I think it's fair to say that it will become more and more um, relevant as we move forward and embed those principles of trying to track the materials that we're using in our construction and be able to use those again in the future. Thank you. Okay, and also just to mention, I'm glad Stephen mentioned uh, stone. It's my favourite topic. And just to work out, concrete is just reconstituted stone. So using stone cuts out the middle manner, basically destroying stone to create effectively more stone. Um, Councillor Gollop, you're next on my list. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Tony. Um, I can see that a great deal of work has gone into this report, and the words in it have been incredibly well crafted. But I don't apologise for being an old-fashioned accountant who actually thinks that business plans should actually be really all about the figures. And I don't think there's a problem with me mentioning things that aren't clear from either the public or the confidential papers, um, even if the answers might have to come later. But previously, we saw numbers of completions by year. Now we don't. Um, I think this is about the presentation, but actually it reads is a housing company of substance. And yet actually when I read through, it confirms, I believe, that there haven't been any completions at all. Um, and that actually is, is an issue that shouldn't be hidden away, that should be a record, not a problem. And except there's the expertise within the organisation to deliver. But it does seem extraordinary that we're not actually admitting where we are, what has been built to date, and what the costs are, and what's been generated. And what's been generated, as I understand it, isn't from selling any completed houses, because there aren't any completed. Well, certainly the report doesn't admit that there are any. So I, I have to say, I'd, I'd want to see more openness about where we are. I'd actually want to see figures that make sense. Uh, you know, Tony, my concern is that we're expected to look at a business plan, but actually we're not allowed to see detailed, even detailed statutory accounts as filed at Companies House, because they haven't been filed yet. So we don't have that information with which we can piece together. It's, it's, all, it's all in there in different places. But you actually have to probe to find it. And for me, if one was looking at the figures, you would have an indication of last year's trading against last year's budget and this year's trading against this year's budget. I accept that might have been in the confidential section, but at least you'd have that information so that you could you could actually see and get a clear indication. But it's not there. It, that background and explanation isn't there. But what we glean is the completions are being delayed over what was being forecast before. Now, as I recall the discussions we had last time Gorham brought figures to us, members were concerned over whether the delivery was capable of being on the timeline outline. We were assured it was. Now it looks as though it wasn't. And the problem in terms of the business plan is each year that there is a delay, the overheads remain in place, but there is no profit to cover them. So the period of time over which payback comes is that much longer. And there is nothing in either sections that can give me any indication that there can be any certainty on that. Now, if if we could be assured that, that Denise or her colleagues have seen those detailed plans and have had chance to review them, um, my mind might be put to rest a little bit but it just seems to me that it's the words are telling a story the figures that we can see don't stack up to that story so I you know I apologize for with all the work that has gone on but I have reservations thank you okay um, I think is there a former question from that which is about whether we need to see how the business plan is performing in relation to what had previously been put forward as a business business plan? Is is that something that somebody would like to respond to? Yeah, no, happy to. So um, 
there was quite a bit in it, Councillor Gollop, so hopefully I'll be able to capture the majority of your points. I would add that we'll be able to discuss in a lot more detail in the exempt section. Um, the business plan itself actually sets out, I think, fairly clearly in our programme the, the progress that each of our projects is tracking through. Um, we are still relatively new as an organisation um, and we order our projects in terms of those that are on site um, and those that um, are tracking through the planning system and those that haven't started in the planning system. We have rebased our forecasts based on where we find ourselves in the current economic climate um, and we have been very pessimistic in our forecasts in this year's business plan because the world has changed substantially from when we produced our business plan, which is the, the current year. So we've taken a very prudent approach, which hopefully has come across in our business plan. Uh, we haven't sought to um, deny anything regarding our completions because, as we point out in our business plan, our first project to hit site is one lock lees and that has yet to complete any homes it is on site and is working through uh, when we've made our business plans they are forecasts until we actually get on site so our previous business plans have been forecasts as we expect to have achieved normal industry norms now that is very, it is very difficult to forecast your track through the planning process uh, I think everybody who was involved in the Romney House One Lockleys planning process will have experienced that it was a very long process. Um, and I think quite rightly, because it was such an important development for the local community, but it did take a lot longer than we would forecast in previous plans. So that has hit our, um, our profitability and has hit our um, cost base. But what we've done is we've really stressed the business in this business plan to try and look at how can we continue to operate very pessimistically by only taking a small number of projects into our business and really stress it as our base position. So hopefully that's come across um, in what we've written. Um, so what I would say is that there's been no um, attempt to conceal any completions on site and I think we've been very clear on a number of occasions that there have been no completions of homes yet uh, for Gorham Homes. We've completed a number of projects for the council and that they've been great and they have helped from a financial perspective and we continue to work with the council on um, how we can support them. But at the moment the houses are on their way. There's some very exciting photographs of progress at Romney House. Um, and I would probably pause there because your question was quite wide. But in terms of a comparison, we've done a financial comparison, which you'll see in the exempt between um, last year's business plan and this. And what we can do also is we can break, we have broken down in the exempt the financial numbers against each of the projects. A lot of that information is exempt because we are currently going through procurement on a lot of our projects and they're commercially sensitive packages of information that whilst we're going through procurement, it's helpful for the council that they remain confidential. So we can probably break it out in a bit more detail and drill into your questions regarding progress on each project when we get into the exempt section. So, Tony, if I, if I can just come back to so one concern then is the timeline for the pipeline. Um, and given the anecdotal evidence about the delays in, in planning permission being granted in itself, the potential delays that you could face, do you believe, when you say you've been pessimistic, that you actually got realistic timelines for starting on site because that is what is going to determine whether you, the funding envelope is sufficient to cover your overheads and we know the situation that, that you know, eventually befell Bristol Energy where it couldn't operate within the envelope because it, it kept having additional pressures and delays. So. Are you confident that you can get planning permission and procurement in place when there are clearly supply chain problems as well to actually deliver on this business plan as you have outlined it? So when we do our business plan, it's a series of forecasts. So we work with our partners, we work with our board, and as a team, we work collectively on our approach across each of our projects. As I've highlighted, the projects that are further through the planning process, we have a higher degree of certainty. So a number of our projects have now passed through the first phase, if you do two stages of planning into outline. That gives us a degree of 
additional certainty of how long the next stage will take. The planning process, as I've mentioned already, is one where there are vagaries in terms of how long it will take to track through. But what we've done is we've extended our forecasts of how long those periods will take to be pessimistic in comparison to previous plans to try and push that time envelope out. It's worth adding as well that we as an organisation are a small organisation with lean overheads. Um, we intend to have some growth for the forthcoming year to be able to push the rest of the programme through, um, but we are very conscious about keeping our overheads within a, an envelope that is affordable for the organisation, so we watch that very closely. So. The forecasts in our business plan are ones that, as a team, collectively, we feel are appropriate at this moment in time, based on this window of economic condition. I cannot forecast the future, but what I can forecast is that we have built a prudent plan based on what we know today. Okay, and just to remind, I sort of mentioned this earlier on, and that one of the outputs from today's meeting will be um, a report from OSM to Cabinet. So after the exempt session, we will be spending t some time discussing what we may want to say in that report to Cabinet. Um, and Councillor Bradshaw, I believe you had your hand up next. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation as, as well. Um, I, I'm pleased that you're setting up a finance and audit committee. Because obviously risk is really important in this game particularly as uh, all of your activity is, is through to JVs with an external partner. So the risk is somewhat different and needs to be controlled and managed. I've got three quick questions. First is, uh, really pleased to see the commitment to a skills academy. Is this connected or is going to work with the Advanced Construction Skills Hub in South Br Bristol? It's quite clearly that's really important for the future economy of the city region and um, will give particularly young people those skills that they need uh, in the future to work in the construction industries. Um, second question is, and this may be more for the exempt, but I'm going to test it out. Obviously, we all know the impact of inflation. In construction, it's much greater than the CPR, materials in, in inflation pressure on labour, particularly skilled labour in construction as well. How is this being mitigated through the JVs and your plans? Because clearly it's impacting across the whole industry, across the whole country, but will be magnified given that you're quite a small operator in the development industry. Uh, the third one is, and this may have been set out in the presentation, but clearly you're the council's housing company the council's biggest direct intervention in housing is as a social landlord through the HRA. Could you just give a, a kind of outline about how you're working with the housing revenue account, with the offices responsible for that? Because quite clearly, a lot of the housing opportunities are in the land and estate, which is controlled by the H HRA. Sit, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bradshaw. So, um, skills first. So, the uh, Skills Academy that you mentioned is in Hengrove, so a little way away from the uh, Skills Academy up in Lockleys. So, we are very confident that we'll be able to work with the communities in the north around the Lockleys Skills Academy. However, when we move down to move into a delivery phase at Hengrove, that won't be as practicable. So we have already started to work with City Bristol College and have had a number of meetings and been and had a look at the facilities and talked about with them how we can use the work that we're gonna do at Hengrove to help um, apprentices and students get the skills that they need to be employable now. Um, the college are really excited about our development coming. Uh, we'll be doing some really interesting things from a modern technologies perspective. There will be another energy centre. That's really interesting and exciting for people who are doing those courses at the Skills Academy. And there is more that we can do. So we are working with them. They're really open as to how we can work together to make sure that those courses are really touching on the skills that the construction industry need. So definitely something that we're working on. We've got a great relationship with uh, City Bristol College and we'll continue to do that. So really quite excited about what that looks like um, for South Bristol and Hengro. Um, in terms of materials and labour, um, what, as you mentioned, we are a joint venture business. 
So as a organization ourselves, we would be very small and would struggle um, to make sure that we were able to control some of our cost inputs. Uh, we work in partnership and we work with larger organizations that allow us much more security regarding our ability to be able to maintain costs at a level that means we can have viable projects. So we work with large multinational organizations with very strong supply chains. Uh, we have found that those relationships work well at controlling our cost base. Uh, they've performed well on our project at One Lock Lease, um, and that has gone very successfully in terms of ensuring the um, financial position hasn't markedly changed from the initial proposals that we took from them back in 2019. So we are very positive about the approach that we're taking with joint venture partnerships because there's also a share of risk and reward. So we're able to use uh, larger supply chains, share risk and reward with our partner. And we think that in a volatile market that we're in at the moment, that, that really does help. So we would um, really be very clear that the joint venture approach is, is a good one um, to be able to manage those risks. And what we find uh, when we're doing procurements now, that that is holding true. Um, there are some challenges in other areas that we can pick up in the exempt section. Uh, but that's probably a, an overview of where we are in terms of the, our ability to be able to control costs in the current market. Um, how we work with the HRA. So uh, Gorham is set up as not an asset holding company. So we are a developer. So everything that we develop, we sell. Uh, so each of our projects, we talk to the council um, and have a conversation about the affordable housing that will be generated as part of the development. Um, and on a case by case, project by project basis, there's a first consideration to the council to say, would you like to acquire these as council housing? Um, and then when the council have made their decision, we then decide whether we would um, pursue um, a disposal to a housing association or whether the council are going to take those. Uh, so we work very closely with the HRA, but they are um, there's a contractual relationship between us. Um, what actually becomes between the limited liability partnership and the HRA. So Gorham is a is a part owner of that company, so it becomes a bit disconnected. But we have a close working relationship. They're taking the um, homes at uh, Lockleys at Romney House uh, that started on site, and they'll be the first ones to come over. So they'll be council housing. So hopefully that answers the HRA question. If there's any more on that, I probably would defer to Jesse. Je Demand, do you want to come in? So it's not on the HRA, but uh, on the point that you made about inflation uh, and risk. So one of the things that the board asks for is uh, that we have sensitivity analysis, not only on every scheme, but also on the business plan as a whole. And we use various stress uh, of factors, inflation, building cost material, uh, supply of labor, health and safety, everything. Uh, and then we build our business plan on the basis of the stress factors that I've alluded to, not just those, but many others as well. And then the board monitors them uh, quarterly, uh, and we have a thorough review at least twice a year. Jesse, do you want to? Yeah, just to, to expand a little bit on the HRA working relationship, but I think this is one of the opportunities of having a housing uh, delivery company as part of the Bristol Council um, uh, family of, you know, uh, where we are, because actually it means that we can have that good working relationship. We, we meet with, with Gorham Homes, with Steve, particularly regularly. We're in, we have, are able to have a lot of those conversations ahead of time through the formal channels as well as more informal ones, which enable a lot of those conversations to be had, which, yeah, it, it means that I can sit here and say I'm really comfortable with the good working relationship we have, making the most of the opportunities that are presented to us. Okay, thank you, Mark. Do you have any response from Councillor Parsons? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a brief question following on from Mark, um, which is that um, the, uh, the pipeline includes, uh, I see here, 1,448 affordable homes. What I don't see is a breakdown of that which would include the, the number of homes available for social rent. Is that figure available? Yes. So um, I, I probably won't read it all out, but it's all written down on this piece of paper that I can give to you afterwards if you'd like to see project by project, site by site, and that will show you um, the minimum numbers of social rented homes and the minimum numbers of affordable um, home ownership. 
That's great. Thank you. Um, I have another um, unrelated question, I think. Um, we've heard that Gorham Homes is in the business of creating communities. And um, for communities, of course, we need not just homes, but also access to education, employment, leisure, retail. Um, and uh, we've also heard today that um, South Bristol being described as in the process of becoming a bus desert. Now, um, what is Gorham Homes able to do, what is it doing, to prevent a development like Hengrove Park from becoming a car-dependent, isolating suburb of a kind that I think we've seen in, you know, in previous uh, developments in other parts of the city? Uh, so some of the points regarding infrastructure and travel are, th are things that probably for the, for the wider council. Um, I think that what we look at with Hengrove is the opportunity of the Metrobus, which is not perfect, um, but it is an opportunity. It will run straight through the new development. Uh, there is a, a hub by the hospital. Uh, the route will be changed so that it will run directly through the development, which will give a link north to south for those who live in the city. I know the Metrobus doesn't necessarily run all the time and, and perfectly, but it will be a well-connected development. Uh, I mean, wider points regarding um, buses and things like that, I'm probably not the right person to answer whether somebody from the council wants to make a comment, I'd pass over to them. I don't think we have anybody here that's able to respond to that, um, unfortunately. Um, do you have anything further, Barry? No, thank you. Councillor Kent. Thanks. I won't get into the Metro bus route, given there's many people in Hengrove that will oppose the moving of the Metro bus route, because it will create, of course, a new bus desert in the communities of Hengrove and Whitchurch if you were to move the route. But we'll move on from that. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the business's um, uh, risk factor regarding the market situation that we now currently see. So I was just looking at the assessment of key risks on Appendix B. Uh, and although I see higher inflation uh, as a risk, what I don't see is a risk of a of a, a reduction in the housing market, so in, in the value of, of, of houses. So is there a reason why that's not down as a separate risk? Because, you, of course, you can have house values reduce uh, separate to inflation. So the approach that we take uh, regarding risk is quite holistic in the business plan. It drills down a lot lower in the detail that we share with our board. So we capture in our business plan the top risks at the moment. So the description probably doesn't capture all the factors that is built in. Um, and regarding the business plan, as we move through the phases of uh, maturity of the developments, risks start to crystallise in the business itself. So where we're moving through the planning process, things like the housing market haven't crystallised in any of those projects. So our exposure at the moment is limited to the project that we're working on at the moment, a one lock lease in Romney House. So that is the only project at the moment where we're exposed to housing market risk because that is contractually complete and has started on site and everything is fixed. Everything else in our program is variable while we track through the planning process. So housing, house prices can move, costs can move, and then they are crystallized before we, we start on site. So at the moment across our, our pipeline of projects, the housing market risk is one that we track um, and is a conglomerate within our, our suite of risks, but we're not hugely exposed until we start on site as an organization. The mark, do you want to add? I mean, I think the general point that you make is well made. Uh, we are in joint ventures, so, so we would need to take into account uh, possible fluctuations in the marketplace, uh, and the joint venture company would do that by, as part of its business planning process anyway, which then fills in into our business planning. Thanks. Uh, just to follow that up, I, I, I see the point you're making that you're only really at risk where you've broken ground on a project. Um, obviously, there's potentially a risk to the council as your owner because that might then impact on money back in, into the system. But I see, I fully understand the point you're making. Just to follow this up, uh, on sort of page 40, I think, uh, where it starts talking about uh, the market scenario and market risks, you obviously have put some figures in and I even say, you know, 
uh, on a possibility of a 20% reduction in, in, in market value of houses, which of course is roughly the, what we saw in 2008 crash. Um, my concern is, do you also measure uh, the market based on the new build houses? Because the market is very different. I mean, I was sort of looking at a report that in 2021, in fact, new build houses were, went up two to three times the rate that uh, existing households did in inflation. Uh, obviously, what concerns me is, are you then, in fact, more exposed than the general market as a new build? Because obviously new build houses often cost a little bit more than existing houses, naturally, and so that might mean that you're more exposed in a uh, if household uh, if house prices began to fall. Have you do you consider that, or do you just look at the general market rate? I guess is my question. So um, within the business plan, there is a commentary around the housing market that's not drilled down into and doesn't differentiate too much between the new build market and the second hand market. You're right to point out there is a difference. Um, the work that the boards of the LLPs do is critical in terms of understanding our exposure to risk regarding the market. So as I've mentioned before, we're in partnership with um, large multinational organisations who are helping with the work that we do to check, um, provide the boards of the LLPs market information that is the most up to date that we can possibly get. Uh, so our position regarding the housing market is one that we monitor very, very regularly. So I'm Councillor Wilcox is moving his head. Um, so, so I'd say that we, it's not something that we're able to um, do anything other than continue to monitor regularly. So every LLP uh, board meeting that we have, we talk about our position regarding the market. We are fully aware of um, what is happening with the housing market. There's lots of commentary almost daily at the moment regarding house builders' views about what's going to happen with the housing market. Our business plan seeks to be very pessimistic in what will happen with the housing market. And our relationship with the council means that before we make decisions, with the exception of projects that we've started, we need to understand the risks that we collectively are taking on on each project as we go forward. Uh, but that risk should be recognised to be risk that is shared. So each investment that we make in one of our projects is on a 50-50 basis with somebody else. Now, their assessment and our assessment of the risk regarding the housing market is one that I feel is uh, prudent uh, based on what we know today, but relies on a degree of forecasting that has a degree of risk associated with it. But that kind of is the, the, um, the business that we're in. Some of the risk is mitigated by the fact that we deliver very high levels of affordable housing. So 50% of the projects that we do, the homes that we build in our projects, are basically sold. So we're taking sales risk on only half of the output of each of our projects. So that is helpful in terms of managing that risk. And I would say the final point in terms of risk of um, sales is the uh, desirability of Bristol really does help. I think I've said this in previous years. Bristol is a fantastic place to live. It is very, very desirable. I don't see that changing in the future, which means that we should be at the moment careful and cautious, but optimistic about the prospects of the housing market. But again, the business plan that we present to you only considers the most advanced projects and is pessimistic. And we will continue to feed back into the council what happens with the housing market as we go forward. Okay. Um... I'm going to go quickly to the councillor uh, Gollop, and then I've got a couple of questions myself, and then I think we'll take a comfort break. Um, I just really wanted to follow on from from Tim's questions because I find this idea of saying that, it, that the risks are proportionate, and because we're not building very much at the moment, the selling risk is less significant um, because the business plan talks about three thousand odd completions, and the price at which we complete is going to determine the viability of the business. So actually, I see that as a critically high risk. Um, but I also come on to what may be a naive question in terms of, of housing and affordable uh, houses. But you said because they're affordable, it doesn't matter. But surely, if the price of housing falls, doesn't the price of affordable housing fall as well? I would have thought the HRA isn't going to pay over over the value of a house um, just because 
that's the price that you want to sell it at. Surely the HRA has got to look at paying within what the market would consider reasonable, and therefore it can't overpay. So I, I, I have a concern about how the risk is being incorporated, and I would question whether that is an that attitude to risk is commensurate with the council's view of risk, where I would expect a risk register to look at all the risks in the period of a project, not simply those that are more pertinent at the stage the project's at when the report's being presented. Okay, so if I deal with um, affordable housing first, uh, the point to take regarding what is the value of affordable housing, the value of affordable housing is not connected to the value of the house on the open market. So affordable housing valuation is calculated by the rent that is paid. So it's because you're not able to dispose of affordable housing for full value sale on the market, the price that an affordable housing provider pays is based on the passing rent that you get. Um, that is subject to very different fluctuations than the housing market for sale. So it would mean that you would the, the HRA or any other housing provider would make their assessment of what their expectations are of rent over a 30 year period and then work out the value that they will be able to offer the affordable housing. That is then fixed um, when you start the project on site. So they purchase the project at the beginning. Uh, they carried a risk in terms of rents reducing over a 30-year period. So that's an assessment that each housing provider does. And when I point out that it's a, a, a risk, it's not a risk to us, that's because the risk of that is borne by the housing provider and it is fixed under a development agreement contract for sale. That's very common. That's the process of um, all developers follow where they're selling affordable housing out of their developments. In terms of risk, I think that I'd, I'd remake the point that uh, was to Councillor Kent, is that the risks become crystal when you start on site. So across our projects, um, they are not crystal because we haven't started on site other than Romney House. And what I would also add is the risk assessment is on the business plan, not on each project. So the appendix that you'll see is an assessment of risk of the business plan. We haven't done an, or published in the business plan an assessment of risk of every single project because it's risk at the level of the business plan itself. We are monitoring the risk um, and we do that and share that with the council through the clienting processes that we got and the board assess those levels of risk on each of the projects. So we drill down but for the purpose of the business plan we do a high level assessment of risk of the business plan as a whole and that's what's in the appendix not as I say the scoring of individual projects. Amand, do you want to add? If I may. So you see, when we are assessing risk, and to answer your question specifically on future values, what you would do uh, when you've got a site is to work out uh, what the future value might be, and there's a range of indicators we use to arrive at that figure. And that is const constantly monitored uh, pre-tender, post-tender. And if the prices have fluctuated widely and the, the, that particular scheme does not stack up, then you would not normally start on site, you see, because the market has changed. There is an element, of course, of risk in everything that you do, because from the time that you get onto site and from the time that you complete, depending upon the size of the site, it can be anything from between 18 uh, months to say 36 months, depending upon the, uh, the size of the site. So there is an element of risk, uh, which you then have to build in into your sensitivity analysis. So not, not to prolong this, but, but my concern is that if you have a large housing company that has 20 pipelines around the country, they can make the decision to not proceed with one where the value is inappropriate. If you have three and you need that pipeline in order to generate an income to cover your overheads, you don't actually have the option of not going ahead because you don't have any income to cover those costs and you don't have a funding envelope to allow you to continue. So that's where I I see the risk as, 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 as needing a more commentary and more mitigation. So if, if we um, consider the 
processes that are in place to, for the council to be able to manage the risks that we're taking on our development project, if I explain further. So each project that we take forward is subject to reserve matter approval by the council. So the business plan sets out an envelope. It does not give Gorham Homes the authority to be able to enter into contract. That is reserved for the shareholder. So on what and lock lease, as Aman has highlighted, we present to the shareholder a business case that sets out a number of factors, including land and profit, and all the details that the shareholder can see alongside our board and a recommendation to approve that we move forward with a joint venture on the basis that it is viable. That happens with all of our projects and the council working with Gorham will look at each of those projects as it moves forward and our funding envelope to make sure that they balance with one another. So each time we bring forward a project, the next one could be um, Dovercourt Road or New Fossway. They get a detailed report that shows the profit that that is forecast to make and then you better map that back into the financial plan that Chris has outlined in the in the business plan. So as the shareholder you can see um, how each project is feeding into that process for the council. Okay thank you. Um, I'm going to reserve my questions for the exempt session uh, because it's Ten past two, so I've recommended we take a five minute comfort break and then we'll come back and we'll look at the Bristol Holdings business plan. Okay, thank you very much. So if we can be back by quarter past, please. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um next item on the agenda is Bristol Holdings Limited uh business plan. I'm assuming this is gonna be you, Chris. So over to you. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, councillors and members of the scrutiny board. My name is Chris Smith, so I'm the interim group finance director of Bristol Holdings. I'll just give a brief overview of the plan, five minutes just to talk about that, and then take any questions afterwards. So Bristol Holdings is submitting a business plan for one year only. It's a plan for a lean operation it's also important to realise any charges that are incurred by Bristol Holding, the model is that they're recharged to these subsidiaries. So the fundamental assumption in line with the Independent Shareholder Advisors Review around the governance arrangements for Bristol Holding is that Bristol Holding will transition during the next financial year, 22, 20, 23, 24, to operate with a much reduced role and there's also an option to function as a shell company if required, if desired. So it's set up for that possibility. So this follows the disposal of Bristol heat networks and clearly, clearly leaves two companies in the group, Gorham Homes and Bristol Waste. So the Bristol Holdings functions, they'll be transferred either to the council or to the remaining companies in the group. The assurance activities of Bristol Holdings will be transferred to the combination of the assurance committees, but only, only if they reach maturity during the next few months. So the business plan therefore focuses on, what, focuses on winding down and transitioning Bristol holding assurance and scrutiny functions and will ensure a handover to whatever desired model is ultimately alighted on. But please note a decision hasn't been made as of to date. We've just it, that enabled the business to be lean and have the agility to, to actually move to whichever model is agreed on. But the aim at the moment is to complete this process in eight months. But the financial assumptions in this plan are for a full year. So that's A, to be prudent, and B, just to build in a little bit of timeline if needed. In the meantime, so Bristol Holding will continue to provide governance and assurance to the shareholder and the strategic client as their role as their role evolves 
So in summary, the Bristol Holdings business plan reflects a, a very much a reduced establishment, both in terms of the board and the support staff. Other costs are included and are needed in the year. So for example, what do we mean for group wide activities? For example, external audit is still required for the, group, for the companies in the group, tax advice, and also insurances. So they're still part of this plan and part of the charges. Ultimately though, these costs, whichever way they are borne, are borne by the council or subsidiary companies. It just depends in which pocket it gets allocated. <coughs> so the big picture, in, in the overall summary is that the, the, the costs of Bristol Holding, you'll see in the bit, there's a table actually in the business plan. And you can see that from the year 21, 22, the costs were 563,000. They've come down to this financial year to 370,000. And for the next financial year, 23, 24, to 241,000. So you've seen that reduction in costs. That's a 57% reduction compared with two years ago. As I say, it's still providing assurance, but we've got the ability now to, depending on the decision made, either operate Bristol Holding as a continued assurance company or as a shell company, but with the assurances elsewhere, for example, in the audit committees in the companies. So that's, that's a real sort of summary and overview. I'll just open it up then to any questions. So, any councillors have any questions for Chris? Councillor. Thank, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I understand where we are and that the responsibility for understanding and managing risk sits with each of the subsidiaries because they know their m marketplace is best. But there was some benefit in what Holdco did in looking at group risk and trying to, um, I, I guess, push forward a, 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 a consistent approach to how you evaluate and manage that risk. Do you think that will be lost as Holdco transitions possibly even to a, to a shell company? Thank you, Councillor Bradshaw. I think it's a very good question. The key here is that we need to be sure that the ARACs, I'll call them, the audit and risk committees in the subsidiaries are mature and actually that we've mapped over the risks from, from, from the Bristol Holding Group registers to the individual ARACs, to the individual audit risk committees. And a decision, will, I think you've got a very good point, Bristol Holding does provide an overarching assurance Assurance doesn't come at no cost at all, so I think that's an important point. But we're mindful of the fact that overall we're looking for cost savings as well, and that, that enters the equation. Again, just to be absolutely belt and braces, that there will be an independent double-checking, a review, in the summer before any permanent decision is made, just to ensure that those assurances are in place that framework can still carry on. What I would say is the, my observation is, is that the personnel that have been recruited to the new audit committees are of a, of a high quality, a high standard, industry savvy, as specific to those industries. Um, I'd also add that overall, there's, there's, been no, there's been overall increase in the cost of assurance. So you've got the savings from Bristol Holding, but you've had some investment in the individual audit and risk committees, but actually I think it's, that's a good balance. But I do, we reserve judgment, uh, Councillor Boucher, around you know, the, the role of holding just to ensure that we carry out that double check in the summer, that the assurance is there. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes uh, thanks for that. I, I suppose my point is that whilst you have people on the subsidiary boards who know their industries extremely well. It's not a question about the c calibre of who, who's involved and their experience. There's sometimes some benefit from having, if you like, an external 
review point of people not so intimately involved in that sector looking outside and saying, well, actually, have you thought about this? Have you looked at this risk? You know, the, the sort of questions that I and my colleagues are asking today, and, and there is some advantage in that, rather than adopting, if you like, a more insular approach. Agreed, and we've taken that on board. So in the planning, we, have, we, we, do, we do anticipate there will be a need for a resource, be they sitting either in BCC or a Bristol holding, whichever part of the business, but to, to actually carry out that overview. So that, that, that overview scrutiny piece is still, is still needed in some form. Councillor Wilcox. Thank you, Chair. Um, you referred to the uh, table on page three of your um, report. Uh, I'm interested in the, in the current charging assumptions section. Um, I'd like to try and understand why the, uh, the charge is going down for Bristol Waste but going up for Bristol, uh, for, for Gorham Homes, uh, and what the 10 and 18 percentage figures refer to, please. Yes, thank you, Councillor Wilcox. In reviewing the allocations, we effectively are ref reflecting the increase in activity through Gorham Homes as they become live. So within that year, they will become live and therefore their proportion of the recharge is going up. And of course, the other factor in, in the mix is before we had a third company, Bristol Heat Networks. So in, in the mix, it looks like, uh, first of all, the quantum's gone up, but also their percentage has gone up because of that earlier point, the earlier point I made, which is that they are getting greater volume, greater activity. But that will continue to be scrutinised because we believe that that transparency is needed you know, throughout the process. So we continue to look at that uh, on a quarterly basis and we'll share that with the subsidiaries just to ensure that, that you know, people are comfortable with that recharge. Thank you. I sort of understand that. And do you think uh, that even though uh, Bristol Holdings Limited is actually running on a skeleton basis, they can actually still provide that level of scrutiny that you've been talking about? I, I do. I think that the resource that we've got is uh, very experienced. I think also we, we are sitting on the board, boards themselves and on our acts. Um, we have got there's less volume because, as I said, you've got less, less activity from Bristol Heat Networks coming out. That was a big chunk of the work. So my belief is, whilst it's, it's, a, it's a stretch, but actually it's more efficient. It's more efficient in terms of our time, and I believe it's well allocated to the businesses to provide that check and that scrutiny. It's not ideal, but we're in a cost of living crisis, and so we just need to ensure that we... Um, are absolutely fully engaged, which we are, and fully, fully stretched. But I do believe that we can provide the assurance, um, but of course it's in, it's in conjunction with the bolstered assurance provided by the audit committees in the individual businesses as well. So it's a combination of those. Those were not so strong before. So you've got, you've got a lot more uh, control within that, and I'm seeing that already. Councillor Kent. Thank you. Um, I sort of I remember a year or two at audit committee. We were looking at some of the separate audit arrangements for the companies, and we were concerned that they appeared weak. Then um, I don't know if you you were in that meeting then or not. I'm just wondering. Um, I mean, some of these companies are not new. They should have strong audit processes in place. And I, I'm just wondering why you think it's taking so long to ensure this is embedded. That's a good question. I, I think they're very dynamic businesses. There's a lot, there's a lot of um, moving parts, for example, in Bristol Waste. That there's, you know, any business that's um, effectively got uh, uh, sort of 
uh, dealings with, with the public, and uh, you, you've got a lot of controls there around health and safety that are very, very important. So I, I think it's a question of, it's, it's taken some time, I agree with you, I wasn't there two years ago when you, you, the meeting you're talking about, but I think it's been, it's been one of evolve, evolving uh, controls, and I, I can see, as coming out, I've been in this position since uh, July, and I can see the evolving uh, controls and the improvement and the strengthening. There are issues um, as with, every with every business, but I am confident that the controls are, have been strengthened. Um, but as I say, it, it's, you know, to get absolute perfect assurance is, is, is impossible, but I believe that the balance of risks um, are, are certainly being managed. That's, that's my belief. But I wasn't at that meeting a couple of years ago. I'm not too sure what you're referring to. Thanks. Uh, the council switching the way it runs itself in 2024 to a committee system. I was just thinking uh, it's quite important. I would have thought as the uh, finance director of Bristol Holdings that, or Bristol Holding, I should not comp I should not confuse it with Bristol Holdings, which of course is a interesting looking company registered in Guernsey. Um, uh, I have made that mistake before in looking you up. <laughs> Which one am I looking at? Um, uh, I think it's really important that the new committee structure makes sure it designs in audit processes and also governance processes with you. Have you had any contact yet? I mean, I, I'm actually part of the committee that's looking at this, so I'm as guilty if you haven't. We haven't yet, but it's certainly part of the plan. It's to factor in with the advent of the committee system. So over these coming months, weeks and months, it's being factored in as part of our, our review. Thank you. That might be something that adds scrutiny that we might want to look at as a recommendation to the uh, committee, which actually I think Jeff and I sit on, but um, uh, about making sure that we are looking into how we factor that into the governance arrangements of, of the future council. Councillor Gollop. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Um, I, I find a real challenge looking at these figures because part of me looks at it and sees there's a quarter of a million pounds here, and and that's a lot of money. Um, but I'm also very much aware of the points Mark made about actually the the, the fact that the role that's being carried out needs to be carried out. Um, now, I, I'm sort of tempted to remind Denise of my comments a year ago, I believe, when I was actually saying if, if Bristol Holding was going to have a different role, that the expertise and skills could actually be used in some of the trading activities that the council runs within the council. Um, and I would still like to see that commercial expertise brought in to guide and assist the authority and what it does. So that's 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 one point I want to throw out. Um, Chris, one point, however, I did want to question you on because you said about the cost being borne by the subsidiaries. And while strictly that's true, in the case of Gorham Homes and Bristol Heat Networks, they were both loss-making subsidiaries. So the only way they could bear the cost was by the council lending them money to enable it to pay the costs. So I, I think we, we, we need to sort of be clear on, 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 on that circular route of funds. But, and, and, and I'm sorry, Denise, I think this is probably another question for you because it, it is a question of, the role that Holdings plays, as I understand it, is actually carrying out the roles that, if they weren't there, your team would be having those responsibilities to make sure that the risks and the governance was compliant. Am I right in thinking that that's the case, or would, or would the work simply not be done? That's, my, my first question. Hi, thank you. Um, Councillor Gollop, there are a couple of points there that you've raised. I think the first one was relating to the potential to utilise the expertise that we have within um, um, Bristol Holding Limited to provide commercial expertise. And we have sort of indicated that we would still like to have that functionality to be able to do that and have an agile model that will enable 
the council to utilise the expertise uh, and commission uh, additional support um, as and when required. So I think uh, the, the aspiration for that flexibility still uh, still remains. Uh, the point that you made uh, is is a good one in terms of actually if we move to a a shell um, um, company, then what will that mean in terms of transitioning of functions to to the council and, and council officers? And it would be across a range of different areas. It wouldn't just be within finance. We obviously have now a strategic client. Uh, we also have a strengthened shareholder liaison function that takes on some of those uh, roles. And we also have um, uh, meetings where a group of different individuals cross disciplines that come together uh, to do that. I mean, we're clear that it has to be a safe transition at the time that it does do that. And I'm also clear that uh, within the current finance function, we do not have the additional capacity and hence we want to ensure that uh, that assurance work still continues to be undertaken uh, by Chris and colleagues uh, in BHL. Uh, and that's the sort of model that we have in place at present. So it will be a transition um, and that we wouldn't transfer until all the functions until we're clear that it is safe to do so and that we're, in, we're covering all of the areas from different resources. Stephen, I think you wanted to... Yeah, thank you. I mean, just to reinforce that, obviously it is a, an evolving situation. It all depends on what, what you have, what's the business that's before you. So clearly we had the um, Bristol Heat Network Limited and the transfer to um, City Leap, which obviously meant that there was a huge amount to do so we knew that we would get through that and we would have another look. Um, we're always trying to provide you know, the best assurance we can to the shareholder ultimately for the best value. There is always a view that says you need an e another pair of eyes on. The companies would tell you, I think all, both companies would say, we want our own ARAX and you can be the judge as to whether they reach a level of maturity that provides you with as good as an assurance as you would get by having your own team. We haven't reached that point. The Navigo piece of work will be an objective view. They're the experts, and we, we haven't, you know, we haven't predetermined what the council will do once we reach that. And we, we may never reach it. Who knows? But the point is, it will be only when the maturity is there that we feel that we, we may be able to live without BHL, create some some savings, whilst providing an equivalent level of assurance to the shareholder about what's happening in the companies, and to reiterate, Chris and. Denise, that there will, there will be additional functions picked up elsewhere. So we haven't reached that point yet, but the point is the workflow, the workload of BHL has changed and no doubt will continue to change. At the moment, it's in a slightly downward trajectory, but it may reverse. As Denise says, we may call on it for different things in future, so we'll keep it under review. Okay, and I'll, and I'll just add one, one thing to that. I think one of the comments that was made was about um, one of the reasons for, for the reduction was there were less companies. We now only effectively have two companies, and that there is you know, no new companies are envisaged. Um, obviously, we're not capable of predicting the future. Um, Tim has already mentioned we're moving to a new um, model of governance. Um, also, without wishing to upset Jeff, we may have an entirely new government within a couple of years' time as well. You may have a completely different approach uh, to uh, local government, or who I'm not that optimistic, to be honest. However, um, I think one of the things that's come across in this meeting, I think we are in that situation where, to a certain extent, we are trying to predict the future in an, at a time when there is massive uncertainty. Um, we hope that we're, we're getting it right, which is why we are asking tough questions and we're going to proceed in that into the next part of this uh, session um, because unless there are any further questions from councillors I am going to move us into a exempt section um, so item number eight on the agenda is exclusion of press and public this is under section 100 subset a one subsection a of the local government act 1972 that the public can be excluded from the meeting for the following items of business on the grounds that they involve the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of Schedule 12A of the Act. Agenda item 9 has so been um, considered to be uh, by virtue of paragraph 3 
because it relates to information relating to the financial or business affairs of any particular person, including the authority holding that information. So at this stage, I'm going to ask members of the public and press to leave, and I'm afraid we're going to have to turn the cameras off as well. Okay, thank you, and welcome back to the, the Watts in Millions. Um, we're now going to move on to a discussion about um, from councillors about any comments they may want to uh, make about and in terms of us having to provide a report to Cabinet. Um, obviously, that should not include any reference to the exempt material. Um, I don't think I need to tell you that, but I'm going to anyway. So, if anybody would like to uh, start the ball rolling, um, please let me know. Stephen's been specially trained. Councillor Wilcox. Thank you. Um, I do like a risk report, as a uh, uh, performance report, as Guy probably knows. Um, so I've got a Councillor Wilcox, we haven't, we're talking about the potential of us writing a report to Cabinet about Gorm Holmes and Bristol Holding. Oh, right, okay. We haven't moved on to. Guy, Guy is willing to wait a few more moments. <laughs> Councillor Kent. Okay, thanks. Well, there was a few uh, points. Um, uh, I mean, obviously this is to Cabinet, but I think actually our statement should go a bit wider than that because I think we need to be thinking a year ahead. Um, and I think one important thing is that we should write to the... Uh, I hate the terminology of the committee committee. It's such an awful... The, the, the governance committee, let's call it, about making sure that they are programming into their work stream about what democratic oversight and constitutional arrangements are going to be made regarding the external uh, companies. And I think we should also include in that a note pops to audit committee about whether or not they will need to up their capacity and perhaps knowledge if they are to take on any of this role or not. I mean, there's obviously a debate on whether or not the holding company will go down to a shell company or not. If it goes down to a shell company, there clearly will be more work at a council level, one officer level, and clearly you would need more officers to deal with that, so you don't just get to save 250,000, but also at a democratic level, and that is, I presume would be a call on our audit company, and whether or not they would need to set up a separate sub-board or whether or not that would be dealt with the audit committee. It was just one thought that I, I, I think that we should be um, expressing, and that's I said, slightly out of cabinet really, but I just think we need to put that on their radar. I think that that's a, a sensible suggestion for the cross-party cross working group on, well, Councillor Gold is vice chair, so you know the right, right name. I think the, the, fir the first question is actually who, who takes the shareholder function, because at the moment the shareholder is the mayor. So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a very good question there that starts with who, who is the shareholder? How are they then provided with the assurance they need? Thank you, Councillor Kent. Uh, Councillor Gollop. But I, I think the, the, the fairly detailed discussion we had about risk, the, there were enough issues there that I, I, I'm almost reluctant to say this, but if Lucy could do one of her magic uh, summaries of, of, of all the things that we were saying. Um, I, they certainly weren't intended to be critical, but I think there were issues that, that possibly would have been dealt with differently if it had been a city council risk register drawn up rather than a subsidiary company risk register. And I think we should be expecting the same standards to be applied in both cases because the risk actually falls to the council at the end of the day. Thanks, Jeff. I think, I think the other thing I want to add is that um, we do have a bit more time um, and for reasons that we would discuss on the 27th, we also have the opportunity to further discuss after that meeting um, what we may want to put in the cabinet report. Um, I, I always find it personally quite difficult to start writing a report 
when we've only just heard the responses to some of the questions. Um, and I'm always grateful for Lucy for her ability to uh, to collect it all together. Um, and I'm sure democratic services are great for the fact that they have got a bit more time this time. But obviously after the 27th, there was only a matter of a week, I believe, before Cabinet, which is on the 7th. Um, so my basic feeling about this is that we have some initial thoughts which Tim and, and Jeff have, uh, have already mentioned. Um, I think we do also have that element about the general, you no, know, it, it refers back to the risk, but it's also the general thing about there's a lot of changes coming forward, not just within ourselves as a council, but also a degree of uncertainty about the housing market. And at the same time, also conscious of the fact that with housing in particular, we're looking at longer framework. Um, decisions being made now will largely not have effect for three or four or five years. And we're, we're looking at some projects that, in the case of Engrove Park, um, subject to planning permission, will continue on into the 2030s um, in terms of delivery. So unless anybody else has anything to add at this particular moment in time, what I would say is if, if we summarize or we'll allow Lucy to summarize what we've said so far um, and then we may want to revisit that again on the 27th um, unless any other councillors want something else to they want to add in. Councillor Bradshaw. I suppose for for me it's, it's this broad economic impact which you know we're not alone in this but it, it will be a material factor particularly for Gorham um, the point about the future governance is well made. There's also, for me, having done the role myself, that if elected members are more directly involved, i.e. being on the boards of the companies, there's real need for some targeted training to be able to do that. It's a very d different role from what we're doing here, a very d different role. And then the other issue that I don't want us to do sight from, uh, of it is this kind of uh, risk assurance overview that if whole code disappears or transforms into something else, that this kind of oversight of risk assurance and so and so on. So that, that for me is a really important point. Yes, thank you. I'm, and I agree with that. And I think there is a, a, a wider issue as well about the potential loss of corporate memory. And I don't think that just applies to what we're do, talking about in this area, but across the organisation we are unfortunately in a situation where we may be losing people and as a result we may new, lose some of the corporate memory we have as well. Um, not just within councillors but also potentially in officers as well. So it's, it's how we create a system that ensures that we retain as much of that as possible. Um, does any, Councillor Kent? Just briefly, I, I think it would be useful when we feed him back to Cabinet about trying to make sure that we've got certain staged reviews. We really don't know what the financial outlook is going to be over the next year or two, we guess. Uh, and I think making sure that the Council is reviewing the, the projects and the risk, every sort of, and I'm sure they are, but also making sure that's being fed back and potentially even fed back to us in a confidential manner, perhaps every four to six months, because uh, now of course, this is in the exempt bit, we've got the pipeline of which project is due to start when, so I won't go into the exact details of that, but obviously we sort of, there's no great surprise that, uh, in fact it's fairly publicly known that Gorham Homes is ramping up its delivery over this coming year or two, uh, and um, obviously as it ramps up delivery in an uncertain market, potentially risk increases. So it's just making sure we have that flexibility as a council where we might say no speed up or we might say no slow down. Because of course once you start on a site, you break you break earth, you start a site. You often, it does depend on the design of that site, but you might be committed on the total delivery of that site. Depends if the buildings are interlocked or if it's actually like Hengrove Park, it would be different. But certain, certain sites uh, don't give you that ability to break once you've started, once you get committed to a certain extent, 
you, uh, you then have to deliver it. So I think it's, all, it's us as a council, we understand what is that risk at certain points. Um, I think we had some, some good answers uh, in both the public and the exempt session. I think it's something we need to keep an eye on, especially as nobody really knows if, if there's going to be a, um, a, a big dip in the housing market or not. Thank you, Cassandra Kent. <laughs> Councillor Wilcox, and then we'll wrap up, I think. Thank you, Chair. One question I didn't get a chance to ask is how uh, Gorham Homes is actually dealing with the issues of planning, because uh, Bristol City Council is its own planning authority, and it's having issues about trying to get uh, the number of planning applications through its own process. And what ways they can actually improve that process and improve the, the pipelining of those um, housing developments that it tries to do. Okay, thank you for that. I think that's a, a wider discussion. This isn't just about Gorham Homes. Uh, it's about housing delivery in general, but I, I take a point. I think with that, we'll wrap up that discussion. Um, I'm sure Lucy... Uh, once he gets a few minutes free, we'll put that together, send it around for further discussion, and then we will add to it on after the 27th. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We're now moving on to the next item in the agenda, which is agenda item number 10, which is the quarter two 2022-2023 performance report. Um, very good to see you. I'm just going to hand straight over to you if you want to uh, do a brief introduction and then we'll go to questions. Lovely. Thank you, Chair. I think um, most members know me. I'm Guy Collings. I'm Head of Insight Performance and Intelligence here at Bristol City Council. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm here to introduce the quarter two performance report. Uh, it spans pages 81 to 156 of your meeting pack. Uh, apologies for the length of it. Uh, the reason it is thus um, it's because it contains the reports, the actions, the metrics and the updates uh, from each of the seven individual thematic performance clinics brought together in one place. Uh, this is the second time now you've seen the revised approach in action. Uh, it's one that draws on performance clinics and combines a range of both actions and metrics designed to report progress against delivery of the corporate strategy. It's therefore still evolving um, and I continue to welcome any feedback that, that members may have. Um, the intention remains to ask theme leads uh, to come along in future in that regard Ideally, we'd ask members to submit questions in advance. I'm aware Councillor Wilcox has, and I can answer a couple of those in due course, but I think a number um, were just related to the actions and the theme, so I'm not entirely sure, but I'll do my best. Uh, and if not, I'll, I'll come back and give you a written response in due course. Um, just before turning to the report in earnest, um, one point to cover was around the position of SEND and the HCPs. Um, it features in the corporate strategy in homes and communities, um, which is a slight anomaly, uh, and as a result of feedback uh, from members and officers, um, we've taken the decision through the Corporate Leadership Board to move it um, to children and young people where it more readily sits. Um, so I think that will hopefully aid um, or lessen confusion around this particular area across two themes. So that's a, a, a move being undertaken um, for quarter three. Um, on to the report itself, um, just to note that this is, is quarter two uh, and therefore this covers the period from July to September 2022. Uh, it's here at the end of its journey through the Council's pathway and, of course, the position stated here uh, may well have changed or moved on since that particular time. Um, as always, as I've said, I can give a high-level overview, but any more in-depth questions, I may have to refer back to the service areas and provide a written response in due course. Um, looking at the headlines themselves, three of the seven themes are on track uh, and four are identified as behind schedule. Uh, that's uh, an objective assessment of the theme uh, chair. Um, splitting it into actions and metrics, if I turn firstly to the actions, um, 67 of the 86 are either on track or better. Uh, that represents 78%, although that is slightly down from quarter one where the figure was 85%. There's only one action assessed as red. Um, this means well behind schedule across all of the themes, and that one is in transport and connectivity. Uh, the action is around maximising regional and national funding streams, including city regional tran sustainable transport settlement, to deliver significant transport and connectivity improvements. Priority projects for this year include improvements to the number two bus route in the city centre. Uh, now, response on the um, performance clinic from the service around this particular um, action uh, quotes a couple of things, namely that the number of schemes are subject to the review of city transport. Uh, committee submission for the number two bus route has been pushed back following a decision to not submit an outline business case. 
and the city centre designs are developing but are awaiting further decisions in order to proceed and I'm aware there's some significant complexity around the, the discussions here uh, and I'm, I'm unable to add too much more to that but can in response to any questions provide any further detail if, if, if you wish. Um, there are 16 other actions across the council that are shown as behind schedule, that's AMBER, uh, five of which are also in transport and connectivity. Uh, they include the mass transit system uh, where the strategic outline business case documents had been submitted, uh, commented on and were awaiting feedback. Uh, strengthening transport links where some delays on the corridors including the A37 and the A4018 were awaiting feedback and a decision from the administration on the city centre. Uh, portway was proceeding. The A4 Bristol to Bath was on hold pending a review by Wecker and the M32 was proceeding. And then the Portway Park and Ride rail station was due to complete in 2023 and the Park and Ride expansion is progressing. They're the bits I just intend to cover on the metrics, on the actions, sorry. I'm going to turn separately to the metrics because um, there's a few more that are identified there as red. Uh, just important to reiterate here as well that they're not specifically linked to the actions, they're standalone metrics. 50% uh, are on target or better. And that's an improvement from quarter one where the figure was 45%. So I just want to focus on those themes where performance concerns were, were identified. And again, we turn to homes and communities. Um, whilst there's comparatively more metrics showing as red, it should be acknowledged um, that in this theme, there are the largest number of metrics across the council. And indeed, it's got the highest number that are significantly better than target. So there's quite a gulf across the stream here uh, around significantly better and significantly worse. And of those significantly worse, there are six in all. Uh, and key among those are uh, empty council properties, which founded, or stood in quarter two at 297 against the target of 150. Uh, quarter one was 304, so there is a slight improvement there. Uh, and linked to that one, the average relet times stand or stood in quarter two at 98 days against the target of 50 days. Uh, in quarter one, that was 75, so there is a slight deterioration in performance there. Um, the service in response to that have advised that a new external contractor framework had been approved and is going live in November. Uh, that would give a 12% increase in capacity. And also a team restructure was scheduled to begin. The combination of those was anticipated to generate improvements across, across quarter three and quarter four. Um, but it should be noted also that these are stretch targets um, that still will be underperforming even against the previous targets. Moving on to the um, percentage final EHCPs issued within 20 weeks. Um, this one is also at red. It stood in quarter two at 36% against the target, the revised target of 50%. During the period of January to June 2022, 128 of the 356 new EHC plans were finalised within the 20-week timescale. In that same period, a total of 366 um, plans were issued compared to 244 in the same period uh, in 2021. That rep represents an increase of 33%. Whilst improvements are anticipated for quarter three, it's likely to still fall short of target. On the 4th of October 22, uh, the Ofsted and CQC send re-inspection took place, and the report was due to be published thereafter and include a judgment relating to improvement in relation to the EHCP process. And I'm aware, of course, that has now been published uh, in November. The other three within that theme um, uh, in homes and communities um, where we were behind schedule was, uh, or, or beneath target uh, were around energy efficiency from home installations, uh, council homes with an EPC rating of D or lower, and the number of rough sleepers um, based on the quarterly count. Let's move on now to effective development organisation. You can see that there are five um, red metrics of, of 12 in total in this theme, showing significantly worse than target, and three are worse than target. Again, key amongst those are a number of issues that have featured as concerns before here, um, although to varying degrees most have been impacted by the recruitment freeze and the budget savings work. Uh, namely, uh, the percentage of all equality action plan actions reporting expected progress or better was 77% against the target of 86%. The percentage of employment offers made to people living in the 10% most deprived areas uh, was at 3.7%, which is, is the same as quarter one. The percentage of young people aged 16 to 29 in the council's workforce uh, was 12.4%, uh, the target 12%, that is, um, the target was, was 14%. The average number of working days lost to sickness, a recurring theme, is 10.2. Um, the target is 9, uh, very, so a slight increase over quarter one here where it was 10.4. Uh, the percentage of corporate FOI requests responded to within 20 working days was 67% against the target of 75%. In quarter one, that was 71%. Um, so the likely number of factors, including officer capacity, complexity of cases, uh, trending topics within the city in the particular period, uh, and that demand, as you, as you know, does fluctuate. 
Um, the three that are, are worse, um, are, i.e. Um, slightly less worse, are the gender pay gap, invoices paid on time, and complaints escalated to stage two. So they were the areas I intended to cover. Um, absolutely happy, as I say, to take questions, um, but reiterate again, I'll do my level best to respond in full, but it's highly likely if they're technical, I'll have to come back to you with a written response. Just also like to add a couple of points, if I may. Um, we're in the course at the moment of drafting the new performance framework, as we do annually. Uh, and as each year, um, scrutiny members will be invited to a workshop or workshops um, to feed back into that. And I know, Councillor Wilcox, one of the things you've raised was around metrics around planning. Um, so we've, there certainly are a number of metrics that exist at the DMT level, that's the divisional management team level, uh, that we can look to escalate and include in the business plan. But we'll, we'll take people's feedback on around that. Um, and say so we'll take the workshops, will hopefully be happening in, in early to mid-March, but we'll let you know the dates as soon as we have them uh, to ensure we get as many people there as we can. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Guy. Um, and also, just, just to emphasise, I sort of said at the beginning that um, normally we would try to have other people here able to answer in more detail, um, but I think we do have to recognise the fact that we are one week away from the uh, council's budget day and everybody is basically tied up doing a lot of work around that. So my apologies uh, for that. Um, Guy will do his level best to respond to your questions as, as best as he can. Um, and he will come back with more detailed answers um, if, if needed. So who would like to go first? I'm looking at you, Councillor Wilcox. Thank you, Chair, and apologies for uh, coming in at the wrong bit there. Um, so, I have submitted some questions in advance. Uh, are you going to reply to them in writing at some point, or uh, yes, the, do you want to cover um, them here? There was, yeah, there was a couple of areas on that. One was around the, um, the tracking metrics for planning. Yeah. Um, there was one around the data not due. Now, the reason that appears is because the data appears annually, and it appears at different times throughout the year. And I know you made reference to theme five and theme six, and they report across quarter three and quarter four. So next time and the time after that, you'll see me talking about those. Uh, and, we, and obviously when they are reported on at that particular point in the year, they are a point of focus for the discussions here. Um, the ones I couldn't answer were the ones that were relating to the, you highlighted, I think, um, theme numbers and action numbers and metric numbers. But I was unsure what the questions were, so I haven't, haven't pursued those any further, I'm afraid. So we can, we can take them offline if you like. but. One thing that's come out of a conversation we had earlier with the Gorham Homes business plan, um, they are trying to limit the amount of carbon they actually use when they actually build homes. Uh, but the average uh, carbon that is uh, emitted when you actually build a home is 50 tonnes. So I'm just wondering if the figures for the CO2 emissions of the council actually include house building in those uh, figures. Uh, so it'd be good to have a breakdown of what figures are actually included in those CO2 emissions, please. Okay. Uh, you, I, I can't do that before you know, I'm afraid. Well, I'll absolutely get back. Guy, um, I think Stephen can come oh, in. Well, on I that. can confirm it's scope one and two as, as, and uh, does not include embodied carbon, which, I mean, if you, if you, as you well know, in, I think the scope three is a factor of 25 times scope one and two globally. So we can certainly come back and give you a better explanation of what's in it, but um, just, just, to, just to be clear, it, scope one and two is basically moving people around heating and lighting, as, as I think is a generally accepted terminology, and th those scope one or two emissions are what the city had set as the first horizon of it in its goals, and so that's what we measure against. But clearly there is a whole different conversation about de true de decarbonisation in your supply chain. Um, it's one we are actually starting a conversation about internally, but we're not reporting on just now. That's gratifying to hear. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, Guy, it looks like you've uh, got off lightly. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Just a very brief thank you for sorting out the EHCP figure and moving into the right column. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, it was. It was, it was certainly you drew driven that Councillor Kent, and it, was, it made common sense to do so. Okay, um, the remaining items are largely for noting, I believe. We have um, agenda item number 11, which is marriage forward plan, which is a standard item. I don't know if anybody has any comment to make about the forward plan. No, good. Um, agenda, oh, Councillor Gollop. 
it's only a retrospective one about the forward plan. I, I do think we should pass comment that the amount of items on the budget cabinet meeting were such that it was impossible to deal with all the issues in, in an effective and engaging way. And just the question of whether it would be possible to consider having two cabinet meetings in future as we used to, so that you have all the finance issues going to one cabinet and then the, the other decisions going to another. So yeah, yeah, there's no right answer, but it just felt unwieldy. And if we don't comment here, we, we have no other means of, of an expressing an opinion. Okay, I believe Stephen is noting that. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a marathon as well. So I think uh, we can certainly take that away. Lucy, we can pick that up. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments on the Mayor's Forward Plan? Okay, item number 12 is minutes from worker scrutiny, which is an item for information only. And I'm sure you've worked all read it in very detail and... Jeff, I know, has experienced it, so it's embedded in him now, as did Brenda. <laughs> um, then item number 13 is the work programme for OSM um, and the other um, committees. Um, I think, is there anything you want to say, Lucy? Oh, just a quick one, members. So um, we're obviously nearing the end of the municipal year now, and also for anyone watching on the webcast. But I did just want to mention there are two dates missing from the work programme that's detailed in your pack. So one is the OSM meeting at 2 p.m. on the 27th of February, which we've been talking about the, this afternoon, which will be to look at the Bristol Waste company business plan the other one is community scrutiny so that's likely i think we've all almost landed on 5 p.m on the 27th of march for that one um, there may be some other activities for the remainder of the municipal year but details for those ones tbc okay thank you councillor gollop sorry but but just a point in terms of future work program um, do we have any plans for the work programme setting for next year? And do we have any plans to bring it forward, given that we don't, we, we don't have elections and therefore we don't need to delay it until June for a work programme setting and July for first scrutiny meetings? Yeah, I think that's an item we should put on for discussion in the next Osm Leeds meeting. Um, I think the earlier we can do the scrutiny work programme, the better. At the same time, we also have to make sure that our officers in the position of knowing when it's likely that things are going to be, you know, actions are going to be ready to come to us as well. So it's getting the balance between the two. But yeah, the earlier the better because it gives us more time to set up the, uh, the various meetings. Um, I think, unless I've missed something, I think that brings us to the end of today's meeting. So thank you all very much for your time and for your questions. Um, go and enjoy yourselves in whatever way you prefer. And I'll see most of you very shortly. Thank you. And thank you, Stephen, for uh, attending for it.